Welcome to another edition of Anglican Unscripted, episode 474, the second Friday recording today. I'm Kevin Coulson. And I'm George Conger, and today is January 10th, 2019. And welcome to another show, George. Um, let's do a follow-up to a follow-up to a follow-up after we have audience participation. I need to go here to my show notes because I can't remember these four things. The four things that you need help with, and this is before you watch the episode, don't wait till the end because you may want may not want to do it. Like it. If you're on YouTube or Facebook, if there's a thumbs up thing that you can just click on, do it for us, please. It helps with uh, just distribution in Google, Yahoo, and Facebook. Share this episode. I see lots of people like it. Got you know hundreds and hundreds of likes uh, every week. We appreciate that. Lots of people comment. We love it when you do that. Lots of people subscribe. We're almost up to four thousand subscribers. That's awesome. But not a lot of you are sharing the program. And if you're embarrassed because you watch us, we're okay with that. But let people know you're embarrassed. You just forward this link to this episode and say, I am so embarrassed I watch these guys. And that will help uh, grow the audience even more. Um, something we're looking to do. Uh, we get, you know, a couple thousand people watch an episode. We want to get up to at least a million per episode. I think that would be a good goal. What about you, George? And that'd be wonderful, but I don't know if there are that many people <laughs> who are quite that interested in what we have to say. Uh-huh. Hold on a second. Your voice went really loud. So I'm going to turn you down a little and I'm going to turn me up a little. There we go. So good. We are good to go. Let's move on a little bit to the news. Oh, the follow up to the follow up to the follow up. I don't know if you guys remember, uh, George had, you had sepsis in, in the, the fall, right? Yeah. And the summer and the fall. And you finally had some foot surgery. Was that related to the sepsis? Yes, I have chronic sepsis, and they went into my foot to take out the bone that is the source of the infections. Uh, the infectious disease doctor would uh, kill the surface problem, but then would go dormant until such time as my uh, immune system couldn't combat what was going on inside my foot. So on Wednesday, they went inside and diced and sliced and chopped and I have this huge bloody thing bandage around my foot, and today I go in for the doctor for the post-operative rewrapping and uh, x-rays and see how things look. Well, if this stops your chronic sepsis, I think it's, it's the right way to go. They didn't have to amputate the foot, so I, th I think you, that, that's half the battle right there. Oh, I don't know. It's, I can't feel a thing, so I'm happy. Uh, <laughs> <sighs> better you than me <clears throat> but keep george and his healing in your prayers please and that we can finally get rid of this uh, chronic sepsis let's move on to the news uh, george and i always joke about corruption in india oh i can post it i can post five stories a day about corruption in india and it's getting worse and worse and before i we move into that i want to set up for you different cultural norms in America, we are, you know, a founded a Christian country many years ago, and we kind of, not recently, but we, we followed the, the Ten Commandments up until like 100 years ago, and we had uh, a kind of a Christian moral sense to our business practices, government practices, school practices. Not all countries have that. And right now, if you're aware of what's going on, uh, America is in a trade war with China we are complaining about their business practices in chinese culture a business person finds no problem stealing somebody else's ideas and using it for his own in fact they don't consider it stealing it's just part of business practice and it's part of the idiom of how they were taught to run their businesses and so we know that we're fighting a war kind of a culture uh, in how th people view business differently. And that's why this trade war is taking so long. Uh, finally, somebody said, we're, we're done having this unfair trade negotiations and we have to deal with it. China will finally probably come to the table in the next month or two and you'll see an agreement in principle. But I still say they cheat. They'll just be held more accountable. Um, but they don't call it cheating. It's just, it's business practice. So let's move quickly on to india 
And we have story after story after story of corruption. Um, I want George to relate the latest story, and then I want to have the, the, the conversation of, is it the culture? What's the latest out of India? Well, as Kevin, as you've said, over the years we've reported about uh, arrests and prosecutions for theft by Indian bishops from their churches and dioceses. At one point, over half of the Indian bishops, Church of South India, were under active police investigation for criminal acts. Well, this past week, the Indian government, the federal Indian government, their equivalent of the Charity Bureau, uh, went in and took control of the Church of South India Trust Association, which is the organization that controls and owns all of the church's property across the southern Indian states. And they've removed the church from control of its own assets. Meanwhile, a criminal investigation is underway against the former moderator or archbishop, uh, Bishop Daya Vasingasam, who was bishop in Madras, and he is in currently in jail. They're not granting him bail on 14 counts of major theft. Now, what happens is the Church of South India was an amalgamation of most of the Protestant churches. And so all the missions and the hospitals and the schools, all these assets built up over 200 years of missionary activity came into the control of the Church of South India Trust Association with the local bishops and dioceses operating the properties. Well, one of the things that the Archbishop is accused of is, let's take this hospital that's worth $50 million, we'll sell it to a, a medical company to run as a private hospital, but we'll sell it for only $25 million. And we'll take a gratuity of 5 or $10 million. So the buyer gets a really great deal on an ongoing enterprise, a church hospital, the a bishop pockets five million dollars or so and nobody's the wiser because the Indian uh, system is so convoluted. Well, the government, after years of complaints by lay people, uh, has finally stepped in and basically suspended the uh, control of property by the Indian church. And even though the Indian justice system takes a long time to crank through, we'll probably see a good half of the bishops go to jail. Um, and this is not a surprise to anybody who watches the Indian church. The Church of North India is equally corrupt. The Church of Pakistan is equally corrupt, as are a number of African churches. Now, let's back. This is 28 dioceses. This isn't, you know, some small... Uh, operation. There's a lot of Anglican operations in India. This is the second largest Christian church after the Roman Catholics in India. Huh. Millions upon millions. It's bigger, <clears throat> three, four million people. It's a big operation. And the church, and the culture of corruption is such that uh, Episcopal offices, bishops, are bought and sold. People who want to be bishop become a bishop in order to make money. And you also have the particular Indian uh, distinction of caste issues. In other words, the moderator, Devaya Singhasam, is the first untouchable or Dalit moderator. And he brought with him his family and other members of his untouchable caste into positions of authority. And they took this opportunity to enrich themselves and their clan and their particular group at the expense of the wider church. This is how this is how African Christianity works in Tanzania or uh, South Africa. Clans and group, uh, the bishop doesn't just steal it all for his own self. In other words, the bishop doesn't have the $5 million. He's had to spread this out amongst his backers and supporters. Walking around money to, to keep the, the support going. All right, so this has happened in India. We've reported in other places it happens. And my question is, you know, the teachings of the church are clear uh, in regards to corruption, financing, all that. There is a, a moral regard within that. Um, we have brought that with us into some Western cultures like America uh, until recently. Is this cultural only in um, India? No, I don't think it's cultural alone. There's a major cultural component. You, so I'll give it a physical answer. Yes and no. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> Let, let's let's move it to India where we can compare, uh, to East Africa where we can compare apples to oranges. Mm -hmm. 
The Church of Tanzania, as we have reported, is a corrupt church. The uh, primate's election was decided by money. Money is passed around. People are elected based on, you know, we act. We talked to people who complained that they were mad because other people got paid more for their vote than they did. That's just how the Tanzanian church works. Uh, Valentino Mokiwa, another primate, uh, was removed from office for corruption. And the reason why he was removed from office is because he wasn't sharing the wealth. He was actually keeping it, and so people complained about it. Compare that to Uganda. Now, Uganda has had a few bad bishops, but the tenor and culture of the Ugandan church is that we shall be clean as the driven snow. They are, in my mind, they're squeaky clean. They're squeaky clean. Okay. Where, and in other words, people write to me fairly frequently and say, oh, this bishop has written to me saying, could I send, could, please send me money for this particular operation. And I write back, do you know that he was removed from office after being accused for, for stealing half a million dollars? You've got, see, the, so the, but see, that's how their politics operates. That's how business operates. Kenya had a terrible corruption problem under David Katari and Benjamin and Zimbi, mm -hmm. they overcame it. And uh, oh, who was the last one? Oh, mm -hmm. oh, it's just come out of my head. Jeez. Oh, well, uh... then falling back into the old times, where the Bishop of Nairobi is corrupt, uh, and the current Archbishop Jackson uh, Ole Sapit does not have the political power because he's a member of a minority tribe, the Maasai to discipline the Bishop of Kenya, who's a Kikuyu, or the Bishop of Nairobi, who's a Kikuyu. So we have these, you know, it's a constant fight. South Africa, uh, you know, the Diocese of Umzumvubi, where I visited, and in fact, I once celebrated Easter 20-odd uh, years ago with the Bishop. Uh, before the auditors came in, do you remember this story we wrote? The cathedral burned down. And with it, all the financial all the records. Financial, kind of an Archbishop of York issue going on there. Yeah, I know. So, yes, it's cultural. But at the same time, there are church, the Nigerians are clean. Now, there's a few bad Nigerian bishops. And unlike the Ugandans, who wash their dirty linen in public, if somebody's dirty, the Ugandans tell us and they get rid of the guy. The Nigerians, maybe it's Nigerian culture, are loath to admit publicly that they've got a problem. They just shuffle the guy out. I've seen some shuffling. Um, and there's, of all the African nations I can think of, the Nigerians have that frontier mindset, that Western mindset, that frontierism uh, that we're familiar with. Mm -hmm. Now, Kevin, do you remember we had stories early on in Anglican Unscripted before the Sudan Civil War of a Sudanese bishop uh, who took a job with the Muslim Islamic mm -hmm. government and basically sold his office and became the deputy foreign minister of the country so that they had a token Christian in the government. Um, if Khan is going to make a difference, I will argue that they need to move on. They're not going to change the Episcopal Church and Anglican Church of Canada. Demography is going to take care of that for them. In 25 years, there'll be no Anglican Church of Canada. They need to start addressing the issues that are real for the majority of Anglicans on the ground which is corruption, mm. government corruption, church corruption, business corruption. The rule of law does not exist in most places of the world. Like you say in China, if I can steal it, why do I need to invent it? Yeah. Uh, now, it's interesting. I, I do know that GAFCON has uh, a bishop education program for new bishops. Mm -hmm. uh, hopefully that's uh, addressing some of the corruption. But, you know, as journalists, we're getting kind of tired of reporting on basic cultural corruption time after time after time, year after year, around the Anglican Communion. Uh, clearly, the Mother Church, they've said nothing about what's going on in India. I've seen no reports of them talking about this at all. When Justin Welby went to South India, he was uh, lobbied by lay organizations to address the corruption issue. And he met with the bishops, and guess what he talked about? Everything but corruption. <laughs> now, let me let me give you a few examples, because, Kevin, we've been on both sides of this issue. Mm -hmm. I think we've shared the anecdote of when we were in Tanzania for the Dar es Salaam meeting of primates. Um, we wanted to get in the 
Archbishop of Canterbury was flying into the airport. You and I went over to the airport, and we were not allowed in with armed guards, with machine guns. And so I, out of my pocket, because I had been to Africa before. You were still uh, new in this. That was my first time to Africa. <laughs> out of my pocket, I get a roll of bills, and I buy my way into the secure area with Kevin. Now, I could have been an ISIS terrorist with a bomb. doesn't matter. No. Five she, bucks in the right that, pocket. That, you can that walk lady anywhere. let us walk around the security system, you know, for the, uh, yeah, it probably, what, 20 shekels? It wasn't yeah. that much. It, or sh shillings, I think. Shillings, shillings. Yeah, yeah. And, but then, so in other words, that's just how business operates in Tanzania. But I remember after the first uh, GAFCON meeting in Jerusalem, the, GAF, the Nigerian press officer, uh, uh, Papula, Akintunde Papula had just been announced that he would become a bishop. And I took him aside and said, uh, let me give you a donation to start your discretionary fund. Here's $500. He refused to take it because as a bishop for him, now this is his discretionary fund. I wasn't, I wasn't buying him clothing. I wasn't sending his kids to school. I wasn't getting him a car. This was for him to use to do the good works of a brand new diocese. He refused to take it from me because of the overt and for him private implications of taking money from a foreigner mm -hmm. uh, because that would taint him in his own mind. So yeah, we've been on both sides of this. We've bribed people and we've seen honorable people uh, walk away from money because it was not how they understood the gospel to operate. Yeah. And this, and this, I think, is one of the things that is holding back the church in some parts of the world, is the perception of corruption. Just as we're seeing the church blossom and grow in places where the churches were their martyrs, we see the church with South Africa is the one Anglican province in, in all of Africa that is really dying. And over the last 20 years, it's got, it has a culture of corruption, of politics, of being tied to the African National Congress, has taken over. So that um, the, the current Archbishop, Tabo Makoba, the government announces that they're going to start expropriating white lands because this, the reason why, because it's owned by white people. Mm -hmm. And we're going to take it away and we're going to give it, not to poor black farmers, but we're going to give it to our cronies. In the government, Tabo Makoba says not a word about the moral implications of this. He just sort of hems and hauls and frets. And basically, we see a repeat of the uh, Robert Mugabe and the Nolbert Kanunga, where the dirty Bishop of Harare was uh, compensated for by the uh, president by being given lands owned, owned by white farmers, which just quickly turned to rack and ruin because he didn't know how to farm. But the church in many parts of Africa, the church in India, the church, and gosh, if we start to talk about the South American church. I, I, was, I don't want to do that. You mean South America used to have the largest contingents of Christians in a continent. That's now Africa has the largest contingent of Christians uh, per continent. Um, you need to really step back because I want to let you know what the secular world sees. You and I, we hear the reports and see the reports of growing churches in, other, uh, in areas like Africa and Asia and underground China. And, you know, the Koreas are starting. And certainly Vietnam has a, a wonderful underground church. We see these reports, met the people, and we can encourage the body of Christ in this. But when you take one step back, what does the world see? They don't see a growing church. They see a church of corruption. Here in America, the unchurched people, they don't have Bibles in their homes. Um, the only church they know is what they see through the media and hear through the news organizations. And all they hear is about a corrupt church or corrupt people within the church. They don't see Christ in the church. They see Jim and Tammy Faye Baker. They do. Jimmy Stewart. Uh, Jimmy uh, Swagger. Jimmy Swagger. They, yeah. I forget who's the... It's got a TV show, the African Pentecost, African American Pentecostal minister. Power, uh, whatever. It's, let's yeah. not name names because in case Dollar, I get it wrong. But yeah. he bought his wife a Lamborghini. <laughs> yeah. Now, Kevin, I I haven't been shopping lately for Lamborghinis, but you know these are quarter of a million, half million dollar cars, yeah. and part of it is the prosperity gospel, and which is 
taken root and hold, certainly in Africa in some places, and the Anglican Church, the place, Uganda, Nigeria, and other churches that are fighting corruption are also fighting the prosperity gospel because they know that's an abomination. A heresy. Yeah. And, but there are some places, India, the church doesn't fight the prosperity gospel. In fact, the tenor is get rich, get happy, get your own. And that means stealing it from other people. Yeah. Now, that's a gross overgeneralization. There are wonderful ministers and there are wonderful bishops in the churches of North and South India whom I've met. But there are lots of, there are plenty of scoundrels. And I, I, and my point here is to let you see, you don't see what the world is seeing. The secular world, when they look at the church and they hear this through the news media, is a corrupt organization of no value whatsoever. When I invite people to church, why would I go to church? You know, it, it's no better than anything else out there, and it, it's hard to convince them. I have, uh, I'm a member of a growing church, uh, growing congregation, and we get a number of people. I had a woman in my office this week who's joining our church. She's an ex, she's a Roman Catholic from Connecticut, moved south to Florida, and stopped going to the Catholic churches because she said, you know, I just can't stomach the corruption among the bishops. I mean, I, I want to be in a place where everything is transparent. And I said, well, that's not really the right reason to become an Episcopalian. <laughs> but I'll take your pledge card anyway. Ha, ha, ha. So, but, you know, the Catholic Church is just being, anecdotal evidence suggests the Catholic Church is being terribly wounded by the corruption of power and authority, using money given by parishioners to help the poor to pay off sex abuse claims. Um, to you know cemetery funds being liquidated to pay off clergy abuse claims it's just so debilitating to the work in the body of christ and it comes down to dirty clergy and for lay people who tolerate it yeah All right the, the governor of the philippines did you hear what he said this morning uh, president duterte yeah no, I, what did he say? He's always entertaining. He's very entertaining. He says, you know, all these priests are gay. Just let them have boyfriends. <laughs> let them get married. Oh, George, we've but taken the, up our list. Oh, what, yeah. what I want to go is that the vast majority of Catholic clergy, of Episcopal clergy, of clergy of all stripes, are faithful and honest, and they do the daily work of the church, day in, day out, the unglamorous, un popular the things that no one is ever going to dramatize on tv or in a novel and the body of christ is sustained and nurtured by those people but we've got this slime or a sheen of leaders in certainly in my denomination the episcopal church of the usa um i can speak about that uh who are dirty let and it's speak, so disgusting let me speak as a business person one bad unhappy customer is worth 200 happy customers okay if somebody's complaining they will not complain to me they're going to complain to other people other future customers other future customers other future customers and i lose future business because of one unhappy person the unhappy person makes the biggest stink my happy customers they just send in their invoice with a check they don't you know i get nothing from them but the unhappy customer is what everybody sees Everybody's focusing on that. And it's the same here in the church. The people don't see the good. Mm -hmm. The news media doesn't see the good. Um, they see the bad and they, they broadcast that. And we need as quickly as possible to wipe out the bad or, you know, our job is done. That's it. What I, if I want to give a message or advice to anybody watching this show is that hold your clergy accountable. Uh -huh. Yes. Father does not know best in all situations. There is a tendency among some churches and congregations and denominations where the priest or the bishop can do no wrong. My bishop, right or wrong. And they close their eyes to sexual impropriety, to financial chicanery, to problems with alcohol. And you don't get bad bishops without bad clergy electing them. Uh, I let me tell you about how one bad bishop got elected. 
I was in seminary at the time. Diocese of Pennsylvania had sponsored me. I came down. The bishop calls every, all the seminarians down to assist at diocesan convention, and we were electing a new bishop. And I had a friend uh, who was an Anglo-Catholic leader uh, who later left and uh, became a bishop of one of the continuing churches. And the Anglo-Catholics threw their vote to Charles Benison. They knew that this man was a scoundrel. They knew he was a skunk, but he promised, I will leave you alone if you vote for me rather than the evangelical squeaky clean candidate. And so the Anglo-Catholics voted en masse for Charles Benison. And who did Benison go after first? The Anglo-Catholics. Yeah, take care. Now, when you, when you introduced politics or accommodation, or, well, we need to tolerate this amount of corruption in the church to go along and get along, you're sowing the seeds of your own destruction. Will Gathcon survive having had Valentino Mokiwa as one of its founding primates? We'll see. Yeah. But if you're a Tanzanian, you know that Gathcon is associated with the corruption of the church. And George and I are not naive in this. We've read the letters Paul wrote. This has been an ongoing problem since day one. We, we get that, but we need, we need to address it because uh, in, in my eyes, it's, it's getting worse. George, that was a fun topic. Uh, let's uh, let's break here at 27 minutes, 47 seconds. We do thank you, people. I'm Kevin Coulson. And I'm George Conger. And we have been slandering people for episode 474 of Anglican Unscripted.